Well, good evening. This is Germantown Christian Center. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis, but uh, you probably know that. That's why you're listening. You're expecting to hear a devotional, and I pray tonight you are blessed by it. You know, the opportunities we have for serving God are presented to us every single day. And, of course, it's an opportunity we have to seize, we have to take. We have to actually, you know, step up to the plate and say, okay, this is the day the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be glad in it. And so today, uh, here in Memphis, it was been a little dreary and rainy outside, but you know what? Doesn't mean we can't still serve God. Doesn't mean we can't still make deposits and opportunities for our future. And I, I had someone ask me, he said, well, you know, if, if I'm not able to, what, what, you know, so what the least we can do is to pray into our future, ask God to position us, to speak his word into our lives so that we're ready for when we are maybe a little more out there with other people, that he can speak to us, that we can make an impartation to somebody. We can be an influencer so that maybe the direction of their life is altered for God as opposed to maybe the direction that it otherwise would take. And so we've been looking at the last several weeks, I guess, things that we could do to help affect that change. And, of course, it may be the area of faith, of, 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 of discerning the will of God through the uh, not just the circumstances of our life, but through the inward still small witness that can be borne out through our circumstances. And tonight I'd like to spend a couple of, just a couple of minutes looking at a few scriptures about what we can do to really see an effective change and opportunity of God speaking, as it were, into our lives and to others. And, of course, it's all predicated upon our obedience. And thank God we're obediently looking to do the will of God. Here in Matthew chapter 8 is where I like to start, a scripture that, that you're hopefully familiar with. And we're just going to just read this and then go off to some other things. But here in Matthew chapter 8, Jesus really had an opportunity to reveal to his disciples the power that he had and that was available at, the, at a moment's notice. You see, we have supernatural ability. We are all equipped supernaturally by God to do wonderful things. And it says here in, in verse 23, it says, When Jesus got into the boat and his disciples then followed him, without warning, a furious storm came up, as it were, upon the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat, but you see Jesus was sleeping. He was resting. And it says in verse 25, The disciples went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so very afraid? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this when even the winds and the waves obey him? And, and I, I mean, we're not going to delve a whole lot into this. It, 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 let's just say it on face value. It reveals to us that Jesus has authority and the ability to control circumstances. And so we all know that it may be in a proverbial way we are sitting in a boat tossed by waves in the sea. And it's kind of nice to know that when you got all the drama going around you, you still have the authority of Jesus to be able to calm the waves of your drama. Even if the drama is something you didn't want, nor to cause, nor invite, but yet you're still having to deal with it. You see, the mission that Jesus gave the disciples were, hey, we're, we're, you know, we're going to get here, we're going to go over there. But just because Jesus tells you to do something doesn't mean it will be without difficulty, without type of persecution, without obstacle. You need to recognize anything God's involved in, it's, it's important, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be easily achieved. The devil is still the God of this world system. We know this, but he's not greater than the power of God. He's not greater than the power of the word of God working in your life. And to me, I look at this word and it just reminds me once again that Jesus has authority over the circumstances of your life. And so the thing that I take from it is make sure you're willing to stand in the bow of your boat, stand up and face the circumstances head on and speak the word. Don't complain about it. Don't lament about it. But speak the word of God into your circumstances, into your, is it where I say, like into your future. And so that takes a discipline. It takes an obedience. It takes faith to say, you know what? My God is able. He's going to change what I'm looking at right now, even though what I'm looking at is hitting me right in the face. And so I look at that and I say, okay, well, it just means that we have ability that maybe we haven't, un that we haven't tapped yet. We have an ability from God. Don't look at your circumstances in the light only of what you can do naturally, but in the light of what God can do through you supernaturally. Let me give you a thing here. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 6. It says there, this is, the, this is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. The end of the world is coming soon. Now, listen, don't... <laughs> 
we're, we're not getting fatalistic here, but, but this is what Peter was telling and saying, hey, listen, there are, there, we're getting advancing toward, the, toward the, the next day. We're one day closer to the end. And so it says, therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. So what we need to recognize is a lot of the times our circumstances that we're looking at, things that are happening that we're confronted with, things that we see in the news media, a lot of things that are happening, in, as it were, that are being presented to you from far or close, you need to recognize that these are things that you might not seemingly have control over, but what you can do is navigate those waters in the will of God. We know that we have benefits from God. We are told that if it were you're reading Psalm 91, how you have supernatural protection, but it's something you've got to appropriate. And I encourage you to appropriate it before you need it. Develop your faith and understanding of the word before it's called upon. I mean, which is better? Is it better to go ahead and be at the, at the grocery store line and you purchased, you know, $30 of the groceries? Probably, what, two items. I'm facetious there. But, and so you, you buy something, and then all of a sudden you, you reach into your purse or your wallet and you realize, oh, I don't have money. Oh, I'll be right back. Let me go and, and, and get a job and work a little bit, and then I'll come back with the money. Well, we all understand that, no, if you're at the grocery store line or whatever else, they want payment now, it'd be better to have it already in your wallet so that when you're need, when it's needed, you have it. Same thing's true about using your faith. It's nice to be able to have the, that faith developed already, that knowledge of the will and the word of God already developed so that when it's required of you, you have it ready to, to use. And so here the Bible says the end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. That earnestness basically is a state of readiness. I'm being earnest. I'm being heartfelt. I'm taking it seriously. You know, your prayer life does matter. And it says, and be disciplined in your prayers. In other words, pray when everything's going great and pray when everything's needing to be changed. When the drama and the circumstances are hitting you, you're ready to pray because you have developed a faith and a trust in God that he knows you, you know him, and you know he's going to take care of this because you're allowing him to get that already developed inside of you then in verse 8 says most important of all continue to show deep love for each other for you see love covers a multitude of sins now again it shouldn't surprise you if you have you know studied the word or if you listen to these broadcasts at any length of time that the two the two things that really are closely associated is faith and love i mean we know this if you don't walk in love, you're not going to walk in great faith. And so you can't walk in little love and have great faith. Um, if you want great faith, you're going to have to walk in a greater love. And so you have to embrace that. You have to say, okay, that means I need to be able to step up my, my, my love walk a little bit or a lot. you know. But it says here that, that we are encouraged to continue to show deep love for each other. And again, he was specifically talking to other believers. You see, the thing that we know, we need to walk in love towards everybody. But you know what? We ought to especially be walking in love towards people who are in our own, you know, spiritual family. I mean, you, you ought to make the concerted effort. It ought to be easier to love Christians than unbelievers. It ought to be. Now, I know some believers do make it a tad difficult, okay? And you probably are to someone that difficult. But what we need to do is make sure that we're showing love to fellow believers, fellow Christians, because they're in our family. It makes sense, doesn't it? Of course it does. And then it goes on to tell us that we need to show that because love covers, covers a multitude of sins. Now, I look at that and I'm thinking, well, what do you mean love covers a multitude of sins? Well, God's love covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? If you walk in the love of God, aren't you glad God forgives you? The love of God does do that. It cleanses you, and we're glad about it. But something else that it, it something has a lot of a lot of other meanings. The idea that that the love that is the God's love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't it nice to know that you know there are things that you're probably doing that you don't even know you're doing, and yet you walk in the love of God. God just like like He can cover it. He can just you know almost just by His grace um, make it right. You know, if your heart is right, it's amazing. If you just keep your heart right, it's amazing how things go a lot better, even if not necessarily everything you're doing is right. See, do you want legalism or do you want to walk in the love and the grace of God? I'd rather take the love and the grace of God. But see, if you, if you don't walk in love, then you're going to be more, shall we say, walking the, the, uh, the, 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 the side of the ditch in legalism. And, and I'll tell you, that's not a place to live, nor do you want to remain. 
most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other. First Peter four eight, and and it says there, and for each other, and for love covers a multitude of sins. So if you want grace to me, that's a manifestation of the will of God and the precious love of Jesus in my life. If I want that, then you know what? We need to be willing to walk in love towards each other and do so in such a way that we know that one of the afforded benefits is God is able to smooth over our, our failings, our, 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 our you know, fragility in areas and really be able to fortify us supernaturally because God does show us that he is able. When we read scriptures in the Bible saying, my God is able. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. That's all, that's all basically great things, but the underpinning of that is that I'm able to walk in the strength of the love of God and with the faith that he provides. And you're not going to do everything perfectly, and it's nice to know you don't have to do everything perfectly if you can just keep your heart right and let God direct your steps. You'll get better every day. You'll go from glory to glory day by day. But, but you know, you're not, you're, not, you're not going to get there overnight. But it's nice to know that that doesn't stop God from blessing you when you walk in love toward others. He covers it. He helps you. He encourages you. I mean, it's just the, the grace of God is so present among people that are willing to be gracious to others and walk in love, particularly to other believers. Then he goes on to say in, in 1 Peter 4, 9, cheerfully share your home with those who are in need or who need a meal or a place to stay. Now, that in and of itself kind of goes a whole other realm because many of us look at our homes as our sanctuaries. And, you know, a lot of people are be willing to say, well, you know, that, 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 that's my castle. And, of course, you know, you see scriptures throughout the Bible about people knocking at the door in the middle of the night asking for food because a, a friend has come from a long distance. And, you know, and because of it says their persistence, that man will even get out of his own bed and give that. Well, because he was inside his castle. He was inside of, you know, and a lot of times you say, well, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, it disrupts my routine having, having company over. I think we all know how this is. Around the holidays, when you have company coming over, does it ruin, ruin or, or alter your routine? Your quiet, your solace, your peace, as it were. You know, sometimes you don't get to watch that show you want at a certain time because it, you've got other people, and being a good host, you defer to them. So it inconveniences you. Maybe your husband or your wife will fix food that's different than maybe what you're used to because someone else has a more favorite food, and you're kind of helping to honor them. It's inconvenient. But God's saying cheerfully share your home. In other words, when things inconvenience you, don't just do them to do them. Do them cheerfully. And that doesn't just confine itself to visitors in your house or your apartment. Whatever you do, especially when it involves others, it may be inconvenient. But the trick is, the key is, the blessing is, do it cheerfully. Do it from a good heart. Because what happens is when you do that, you're able to tap ability, supernatural ability, that you never even knew you had, didn't know you had access to, and you deepen your love walk. Because the one thing about you realize this, if you want to get better and have a deeper love walk, start walking in love. It's like a muscle you develop. A lot of us have muscles developed. Some of us have muscles developed because of certain things we've done, you know. Uh, my son, you know, for many years, and when he was, uh, you know, a kid growing up throughout high school, he was a bowler, you know, with bowling balls, he would bowl. And it was hilarious because he was, you know, for a long time, he was a one-handed bowler on the, you know, he, he, with his right hand. And of course, you know, as most young kids are, I catch him in the bathroom and he's like kids do, you know, showing out in front of the mirror and all that sort of thing. And I'd walk in, I'd look at him like, oh my gosh, this, you know, this kid definitely didn't have any problems with the way he looked, okay? And I sat there and I said, well, Jack, what do you, and he was like, what, what do you want, Dad? I said, I just, he said, yeah, look at these muscles. And I would look at his right arm, and his right arm was so much bigger, his, his bicep, than his left because he had used it for bowling, throwing 15-pound bowling balls. And it was funny. And he knew it. He goes, yeah, look, you know, because he had developed it. It had gotten bigger. And so I kind of take that over there to the about a love walk. You know, you, you get better in walking in love when you walk in love. You get better at something when you do it, but you do it correctly. Someone once said many years ago, I'm sure you've heard it before, that 
you know, practice makes perfect, and, and, and I never really agreed with that because you can do something imperfectly, do it, you know, and, and, and do it, become really good at doing it really poorly. Perfect practice makes perfect. Now, in other words, do something to the best of your ability. Do something well, and the more you do it well, the better you'll get at it. Walking in love is very much that way. You've got to give your whole heart. Do it earnestly. Do it with discipline, like, like we just read. In your prayer life, well, the same thing true when you walk in love. And then he goes on to say, he reminds us, that when you share your, you know, cheer, cheerfully share your home with those in need, that have a meal or need a meal or a place to stay, when it can be, do it cheerfully. Develop that. Then verse 10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Problem is, a lot of times we are looking at things God gives us or how they can benefit us. And God says, I've given you gifts, spiritual gifts, that are supposed to benefit each other. Again, that's a manifestation of walking in love. And you get perfected, matured in that as you do it and do it well. Then he, then he gives some examples, verse 11. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself were speaking through you. Now, I'll be admitted, there are some people who believe they have the gift of speaking, and frankly, somebody needs to tell them they don't. Okay, I get that. Sometimes they speak too much. We get that too. But what he was basically referring to is, if you have the gift of something that you can speak, that you can do, that you, can, that you say it vocally, then he's saying, is that, that, then speak as if God is speaking through you. In other words, do it to the glory of God. Do it to the benefit and the, and the, and the best that you can. Then he says, do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with the strength and energy that God supplies. I look at this verse and I kind of see uh, God covering, you know, basically different types of people. Some people like to be out in front. And that they're, that they're okay with that. Some people don't want to be out in front. They'd rather be a little bit behind the scenes. And God is saying that both of them are important and both of them have a place and an ability that they can tap from the very heart of God. And so the problem we have, we sometimes we, we covet someone else's gift. Or we think, well, because my gift is not this, then it's not as important, but it is. It's very valuable. And God, I think, is speaking to, to, to all of us, saying no matter where your gifts and talents lie, whether it be out in front where other people can see or behind the curtain where other people don't see, God does. And God says it's important. There's a preciousness to it. And he, and he reveals to us, do all of it, whether you have that outward or behind the scenes, you know, type of ministry or type of giftings, do it all with the strength and the energy that God supplies. In other words, you say, well, how do I do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies? Let me get a little key here. I'm sure you know this. But what you do is you do it to the best of your ability. And then when your ability runs out, God, his ability takes up. You know, something was told to me many years ago when I was studying, you know, the ministry, a quote, and um, it, it was, it said something like this, when you, when you study the word of God, study and pray as if there is no such person as the Holy Spirit. But when you minister the word, minister as if there is no such person but the Holy Spirit. In other words, you do your part. And then allow God to do his. You do your very best and God will come alongside and do his. And so we're supposed to do it with the strength and the energy that God supplies. God will supply you with what you have need of. We say it all the time. My God shall supply all my needs. Well, you know what? If the Lord is my strength and he is, then guess what? You can allow God to bring his strength, which is what you need to be able to meet the need that is present and for the will of God to get done. And then he goes on to say this, then everything, again, verse 11, then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not there yet. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, maybe you are. Then God bless you. And he obviously has. But not everything I do probably brings glory to Jesus Christ the way he wants to. So don't get bent out of shape because you're still in a state of, of work. Okay, God is developing us. He's working in our lives, his good pleasure. But the Bible is saying that's our goal. If we can do things because we're wanting to be a blessing to God, letting God's ability work through us, 
exercising that muscle, being, you know, practicing these things, doing these things to other believers, then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. So be it. Verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through. Now think about this moment. He's speaking to other believers. Good believers that he's giving some, some really mature instructions to. And he's letting them know that, that reminding them, you know, that, that they shouldn't be surprised at the trials they're going through. Again, letting us know you can be in the will of God and still have some obstacles and some things against you. We're being, we're being told here, don't be surprised by it. Don't be surprised by the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. You need to come to the point where you expect it. Expect opposition. Don't believe for it, but expect you're going to get opposed. I mean, if you've ever played, you know, you know in, even in, in any level of sport, if you've ever played, you know that when you go out, let's say this, if you, you know, if you played football, you know that as you go out on the football field, you're going to be playing against another team you pretty much expect them not to roll over and let you score. I mean, that would be wonderful if, if they just were like, oh my gosh, you know. But again, you know, very few times do you have the Battle of Jericho in your life. Thank God for the Jericho battles when they happen. I mean, I think we can all appreciate when God says, excuse me, this is my battle. I'm fighting this for you. You just show up and I'll do all the work for you. That'd be great, wouldn't it? Well, can we all agree that not every battle is a Jericho battle? There's sometimes there are a lot more other different types of battles where you have to go in and face the enemy. Um, you know, like David going before Goliath. David was being talked to, spoken bad about by this evil Philistine here defiling the living armies of God and yet David didn't seem to be too phased by it but he still had to prepare himself he got the stones those five smooth stones from the brook he had his slingshot and he had to still sling the stone and it did and of course you know what happened it was embedded within his forehead he was stunned but he was dazed and David walked on over there and dispatched old Goliath there was a battle to be fought and there was a, a battle to be waged both in the flesh as it were in this world but also in his mind and in his heart saying my God is able we can do this and yet the fiery trials that come against you you've got to kind of have an expectation of it so it's not strange it's happening use your faith that you've developed by walking in love toward others that has developed your ability to tap the ability of God that you've seen great miracles happen and once again, it perpetuates itself into greater things because you realize God is bigger, greater than what you thought he was the day before or the trial before or the thing that you had to believe for before. And then he says in verse 13, instead, you should be very glad. Well, that has to be faith there because not many people are glad about going through difficult times. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have had the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the world. In other words, if I don't go through these things, I'm not going to be able to say and see the glory that's going to be revealed to the world. I'm not going to experience that joy. Folks, there is nothing more better than having a testimony that you can look back and say, my God, look what you did. Look how you did it. Look how you were able to show up in this circumstance. And see, if all you're looking at is the circumstance, you'll never see that glory. That's why you need to keep your eyes upon the word. Keep your eyes upon Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Keep your eyes upon him that while you're going through things, you have a constant that does not change. Because the world around you will change. Circumstances are subject to dramatic and radical change in the name of Jesus. You keep your eyes on the word of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And you know what? You have a constant that does not change. And so you don't have to be dismayed. You have an anchor to your soul that you don't have to worry about. And see, those disciples, they became acquainted with the fact over about three years of ministry that Jesus was that anchor to them. That's why they kept running to him. Hey, we have a need. What are you going to do about this? Oh, we're going to drown. What are you going to do about this? Oh, we're hungry. What are you going to do about this? Oh, we got taxes due. What are you going to do about this? I mean, they always kept running to Jesus because he was the anchor to them. Well, folks, guess what? Jesus is still the anchor, and he is our anchor. 
The Word is our anchor, the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. The Word is Jesus Christ. And so when you go back to it, you say, well, this is what the Word says. This is what God promised to me. Then that's the anchor. That's the hope that you have, you hang on to. And that's why you stand up in the bow of whatever you know, boat you're in right now and you speak what the Word of God says. Command, praise, give Him thanks. And then basically you see God be God. You know, one of, the, one of my favorite movies, of course, is The Ten Commandments. Many of you have seen it. It's a great movie. The, the one with uh, Charlton Heston, I, I just love that movie. But to me, it's just wonderful when Moses stands and just says, Behold, and see the salvation of our God. I mean, it's just like basically this is a time for God to show out. That's what he's going to say. Just watch. God's going to show out. We need to be always in a state of expectation of God showing out. You say, well, how does God show out? First, let him show up. Okay? Create an environment, an atmosphere where God can show up where he's welcomed and watch him show out. And so I, I read these verses. And I encourage you to study them and look at them as well. But the ability you have is supernatural. Whether you're behind the scenes or out in front, no matter what you do at any moment of your life, God has an ability in you. Don't make excuses. Don't get upset because things are met with obstacles or difficulties. You should expect it. But you should also expect the power of God being revealed in you and through you. And always remember, it's, imper it's imperative that you walk in love. You, you have to. Your response has to be that way. If your response is not in love, then you're going to find your response not to be in great faith. Because the two are just absolutely tied together. Well, anyway. I know that hopefully this was a blessing to some of you. Study the, Just take those, those verses in 1 Peter. Read them over in your own Bible. Ask God to bring some revelation to you about it. But I want you to be encouraged. God has a plan for you. He is in love with you. And you have supernatural ability. So don't sell yourself short. Amen. Well, hallelujah. I'm glad you tuned in this evening. For those of you joining us online, I know that we have an opportunity every day to do something great for God. Let's not let one day go by that we don't do something that he wants us to do. He loves you. He cares about you dearly and desperately. If there's something we can do for you, please ask. Please reach out to us. If there is an opportunity that you, that you, that you have that you could use, you know, just a prayer. You want us to believe with you. You want us to, have, whatever. Reach out to us. That information is on your screen right now. If you'd like to be a blessing to this ministry and church with your financial giving, we say thank you so much for your faithfulness. You know, that information is on your screen as well, and we appreciate everything that you've done and you are doing to be a blessing to this church. And we're going to be back here Sunday morning. I'd love to see you in person or online. We'll be back here at uh, 930 Sunday School and 1030 Main Worship Service and online about 1045 or so on Sunday morning, and we look forward to seeing you then. Well, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. And remember something, God loves you, and Jesus is Lord. Bye-bye now.